Good evening. Mr. Kugler, we'd like to uh, welcome you back to your alma mater. Uh, so glad that you're here. And um, congratulations on the many awards that this uh, film has garnished, and more specifically, being the winner of the Grand Jury Prize for Dramatic Fe Feature, and also the Audience Award for U.S. Dramatic uh, Film at the 2013 Sundance Film Festival. And congratulations for the rave reviews and critical uh, analyses that have been given to this film. So once again, a round of applause. There have been uh, quite a few articles written in the last uh, few months about the film. And, uh, and I know that some of these questions you have answered over and over again, but uh, if you don't uh, mind sharing um, a few aspects about the film, filming of this uh, gorgeous film. How long was the process for writing the script, rehearsing the script, and then the shooting schedule? Um. Well, thanks, thanks, Dr. Pomo, for all your kind words, and thank you guys for, for staying and watching the film. Um, writing the script, <clears throat> we started off uh, initially when, once, once Forrest Whitaker's uh, production company gave, gave, gave me the green light to go with the film, um, I had a friend who, who was a lawyer on the case who I had met at USC, and I, I had him point me in the direction of all the public documents that were available. Um, about the about the case, so I started writing the script from there, and I was, I would say I was around April May of 2011 um, when I first you know got the outline, first started going, and I turned the script in to the Sundance Labs um, that, that that November of that year. Um, so so I ended up graduating from film school, moving back to the Bay Area, working at Juvenile Hall, and I would write when I got off work. Um, I ended up finishing up a draft of the script some, sometime around November 2011. Turned turned that into the Sundance Labs and. Went to the Sundance Labs in January of 2012. Came out and, and worked on the script a little bit more after that. And at that point, we started to cast um, gen about January 2012. So I worked on it for about for about half a year. Mm -hmm. Very good. And then, re and you said rehearsing. Um, How long was the rehearsal process? We didn't have very much very much rehearsal time. Um, we, we 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 did get support from from a nonprofit organization called the San Francisco Film Society, who um, they do a program called Off the Page. And in that program, they fly out some actors that you might have, put them up in the Bay Area, and let you get the um, script on its feet. Uh, for us, we used Michael B. Jordan, who played Oscar, and um, Melanie Diaz, who played the role of Sofina. And it really helped because both those two are New Yorkers. And they don't really, um, you know, the Bay Area slang and Bay Area way of life is much different from New York. So, so it really helped for, to get them acclimated to, to, the, to the Bay. And, and we also got them to um, spend some time with each other, build a chemistry with each other. And most importantly, I was able to take them to go meet with the real Sofina, meet with the real Tatiana, and spend time with some of Oscar's friends and family um, in preparation for the role. But we didn't have a whole lot of rehearsal time, to be honest. Um, Octavia came into town a few days before it was time to shoot. Um, and, and for Mike and Melanie, we just had maybe, maybe a week before. Very good. Uh, were there any major changes from the time that you wrote the script to once you arrived at the shooting process? Any changes from the script to the actual shooting experience? There, there were some changes. I'm, I mean, we lost a lot of things. The script was really long, um, and we didn't have a lot of time nor a lot of money. So oftentimes we would get into situations where, as opposed to as opposed to thirty extras, you know, I'm gonna have to rewrite it so that it's so that's five, you know, um, uh, as opposed to um, several cars being in the street. You know, we had to rewrite it to the way that it was. Know, more affordable, um, and oftentimes we had to really, I had to really lean down scenes so that we got to, really got to the heart of what what, what was there, so that we can, you know, afford to produce it and afford to shoot it, um, and also I gave a lot of actors a little bit of freedom in their performances. Oftentimes they might do, they might take it in a different direction, or we might agree to to, to maybe surprise a, surprise the other actor, you know, and um, what we would get out of that would be something great, and we would keep that, you know, in the editing process. But for the most part. Um, for the most part, the major beats are, are, are what, was, what was there in the script. Since you mentioned the acting, uh, and the acting is outstanding all the way through, um, your incredible 
knack for directing children. Um, I, I saw that in Fig, in the short film that you made while you were at USC. And now this wonderful work that this young uh, actor has done. Tell us about how do you work as a director in terms of directing children, particularly in getting this beautiful performance out of her? I mean, the number one step, I mean, thanks for your kind words, Dr. Pomo. Um, her name is Ariana Neal. She's an incredible actress from, uh, from Atlanta. Um, and I think the number one step in whenever you directing something, and I kind of learned this actually from football, uh, a, a, college, a college coach um, once said, you know, 95% of coaching college football is recruiting, you know. Um, if, you, if you're able to get talented players, a lot of your work is, 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 done, is done for yourself, you know. Um, and, for the, and for the same thing goes for directing. When you cast the right actors, you know, um, you find talented actors that are, that, are, that are generally great people, you know what I mean, to spend time with and to be around. A lot of your work is done for yourself, and that goes for casting children even more so. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with some really special child actors that, that, are, just, that are just great people to begin with, you know, um, and uh, re really, really act because they enjoy it. You know, not, their parents aren't pushing them into it, you know, um, and they're really creative. You know, Ariana was, Ariana was incredibly creative and incredibly, um, Having you know, she was having fun at all, you know, at all times, you know, through every scene. And if she wasn't having fun, you know, we'll let her take a break and go and go, you know, go go somewhere else. But she was always enjoying herself. She had incredible parents um, that were very supportive, but but not but but weren't pushing her around at all. Yeah, and um, and for me, I love kids. You know, like <laughs> I got I got a family full of kids, and, and I much rather hang out with kids than adults. You know, so <laughs> so, so so I always um, you know, I'm always happy when I'm able to able to able to do that through work. Let's move from the casting a bit to the actual aesthetics of the film. And uh, as I view the film, and this is the second time that I had the pleasure of viewing your film, uh, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, the handheld camera, uh, almost like cinema verite or even or even neorealistic uh, style. So as you crafted the film on paper. Did you have the idea already of having a lot of handheld work, uh, a lot of cinema verite approaches to it? If you can talk to us about your directorial vision, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> in making the film, I, I really wanted to, through, through the, through the mise en scene, give the audience a feeling of, of being right there in the moment. Um, I really wanted to, I really was interested in, in, let, in bringing the audience into this, to this guy's life and for the camera work to make it feel like the events were unfolding right in front of you. Um, one of my fondest memories as a child was, uh, was days when my dad would, would pick me up from school in between the hours of three, and three o'clock when I will get out of school until you know, very late at night, I'll just ride around with my dad and he'll just be running errands. You know, he'll go to the grocery store and he'll go, maybe he'll go check in on my mom at work and, and bother her until she got off at six or whatever and then we'll, go, we'll run off and go somewhere else. And I remember feeling very, very close to my dad. And I remember being close to him in the quiet moments, you know, in the moments when he was just kind of riding around. And I was kind of a fly on the wall, uh, you know, watching this guy's life. And um, <clears throat> I found it to be a very intimate thing to spend every waking hour with, with, with someone, you know, um, to, to go to sleep with someone, wake up in the morning with them, and spend the entire day with them to the end of the night. And I wanted to give the audiences that feeling. And through the camera work, I wanted it to feel like it was really happening, like it was, like it was real. Um, and oftentimes we would sit back in scenes, you know, and let them unfold as if, if as if you were sitting in the corner and watching, you know, watching a family. Um, so, so the handheld choice and, and another choice that we made was to shoot on Super 16, um, was because I wanted to feel to feel visceral. You know, I associate Super 16 footage with reality. You know, what I mean, Up watching old documentaries, seeing that film grain. And another reason we really wanted to shoot film was because Oscar was killed on digital. You know, he was killed on these inexpensive digital cameras. You know, you couldn't really make out what was going on, and there was a coldness to, to, to that footage. I wanted to really bring a warmth back to how we, how we brought him back to life, um, or, or organic quality that we could find through that, through that Super 16. And um, we were handheld for, for most of the film. We had an incredible female cinematographer named Rachel Morrison, who also operated herself and could get very intimate, you know, get right in there with the actors, you know, while they were going through what they were going through. And um, the only scene that we did shoot on, on, on tripod and with Steadicam was in the prison scene um, because that was a point in Oscar's life where he was stuck, you know, and at the lowest point. Uh, so, so that was how we approached it. I see. Uh, thank you. Um, a pivotal part of the film, of course, is the location, 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 right? And so can you tell us about how you were able to manage uh, approval from the BART uh, officials to um, film 
and also the, ex the time elements, because I think you rehearse from about one in the morning until about five in, uh, in the morning. So tell us about how that choice of locale evolved. Oh, yeah, let me answer another question that you asked. We, our, our, our shooting schedule was 20 days. We had 20, a 20 day shoot. Um, if, if for us in this film, you know, um, a big thing and a big theme was, was that Oscar was a product of his environment. You know, um, Oscar was somebody who was born in the Bay Area and lived there and never left, you know. Um, we really wanted to capture the real locations that he moved through, these real places that had an effect on him on this day. And one of the most important places was the BART facility, you know, both the stations and the trains themselves. And um, we're writing the film, you know, I figured that BART would never let us, never let us use their facilities. Um, but eventually I was like, man, maybe we should go ask him, you know, and at least talk to them. Um, you know, I thought I was a crazy idea. So, so, so we went in the BART and, you know, I basically explained to them, like for me, the, the movie isn't about what happens on the platform. For me, the movie is about, about this guy and his life. You know, and he's only on the platform for a few minutes out of this day. Um, so, so, you know, Barr has a new general manager now. They have a new chief of police. And they were very interested in, in extending the olive branch to the community. They didn't want to roadblock this film, uh, especially when they found out that we were approaching it from a, from a, from a mind spec, from an aspect of love as opposed to, as, as opposed to inspiring hatred. Um, so, so, so eventually they, they agreed to allow, us, to allow us to film. And I think a lot of it had to do with me being from the Bay Area, um, with Forrest Whitaker being, being, uh, being a producer on the project. And Forrest has a lot of experience with conflict resolution. He works for the UN, um, you know, both, for, both domestically and abroad. So, so um, they, they, they became very open to, to, to allowing us to use their facilities to tell their story. Um, and I think, I think they, they saw it being as something that could bring healing to the community. You know, um, and I was extremely grateful for it, but, but we shot it in. I mean, we shot in a lot of real locations. Every institutional location on this day had a negative effect on Oscar. And it was really important to me to, to get into those real places. So um, even in this flashbacks, we shot in San Quentin. You know, that was the real, the real prison with real inmates, real guards. Um, we shot in Farmer Joe's where, he actually, where Oscar actually worked and moved and, and, and breathed. We shot at Highland Hospital, which was the hospital that, that, that he was taken into um, that tried to save him but couldn't. Um, and we, we shot. You know, we shot in, in, in the actual bar station, you know, lay right there on the same spot. Um, but, but, but the repercussions we're using real places like that, you know, comes with the fact that these places don't have, they don't, they don't care about filmmaking really. Like, like Bart's not gonna stop their trains and they're not gonna stop taking people to and from work for our movie. You know, San Quentin's not gonna give us <laughs> a lot of time because they got a, they got a prison to run, you know. So, so with Bart, we can only shoot uh, in the hours that the trains weren't running, which ended up being 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. And a normal, a normal movie shoot day is 12 hours, you know, um, and we were working with four on these days where we had moving trains, hundreds of extras, firearms, stunts, you know, um, huge emotional beats for the actors to go through. Uh, but what we did was we kind of approached it with a football mindset. We would get there early and, and rehearse in a, in a school across the street. Um, we would block out, <clears throat> we would block out the, the trains and the different positions for everybody. We would do a walkthrough so that we, we would know um, our stunts and our moves for the actors and we talk it over. We would eat, you know. Um, I would go somewhere and like usually puke because I was so nervous. <laughs> 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 and, then, um, and then we would walk over at, at, at about one in the morning and the train would come in. Um, everybody on the set would hold hands uh, in a circle for a moment of silence because of what, because of what had happened there. Um, and that was everybody from, from the cast to the crew to, to the people that work for BART, you know, to everyone. Um, and then when one o'clock would hit, that, that train would come in and we'll, and we'll get what we could, we get, what we could get. We only had one camera, you know. Um, but one camera, one, one camera, camera shoot. Yeah, and, uh, How long did it take you to block that uh, crucial, horrific scene? It begins with the documentary image through the cell phone. How long did it take you to block that whole sequence? And can you talk to us about what it felt like blocking that whole shooting sequence? What I would try to do, um, I would try to like block the emotions out of my mind as best I could uh, when it came to that to physical movements and all, and those things. And, and and what we would do is is when we were at the school and it was still daylight, you know, we would I would really try to try to get all of the movements in all of the actors' heads. You know, we had we had incredibly smart actors, even our extras. You know, um, everybody knew how important what we were doing was. And um, and and what what, what we would do is is really get, our, get all, of the, all of the movements, all of the physicality squared away before we got into that, into that space. Um, once we were there, man, I mean, and, and, and the blocking of it was, was, fairly, was fairly clear because it was so much footage. 
you know, um, it was in many ways the, the movements was it was almost easier than blocking a normal scene. You know, I had more difficulty blocking a scene with Oscar and Sofina in the bedroom. You know, because you know because of the movements and the, and, the, and the emotional things, and there was no footage to go off of. I mean, with this, we knew we knew when the cops came in, we knew where Oscar was, where his was friends were. Yeah, we had a template. So so that that actually um, that actually helped. But I mean, nothing can really prepare you for for. Um, you know, nothing can really can prepare you for, for for the emotions that 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 Mike has to go through, that his friends have to go through. Um, it was it was I mean it was a horrific thing to have to have to do and have to see you know every every time. Were you involved in the editing process every step of the way? Um, <laughs> um, absolutely. You know, um, the, the first I have two incredible editors. Um, one named Michael Shaver from Rhode Island. Um, he's he's a he's a white guy, about 29 years old. Um, and I have a Latina woman from uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, named Claudia Castello. Claudia is in her thirties, and, and Mike and Claudia work hand in hand uh, when they work for when they work for uh, you know when they work with me. And um, they both moved up to the Bay Area. They moved in a house in East Oakland. I was right there in, in, in the, close to the neighborhood, and and they lived in a house. You know, Mike like slept in a closet, and Claudia slept in a, in a bedroom. And I, I set my office up in the kitchen, and. Um, and we worked right there in the, in the living room, one at one end of the living room, one at the other, and we had one television in between. And um, for the first, we, we wrapped the film in, at the, at the, on like the first, like August 1st, and they came up to the bay, and I gave them um, about two weeks, two, two and a half, three weeks to, to get an editor's cut together first. And we would talk, you know, they would come meet with me and we would talk and I would give them certain types of direction and they would go for it. And they, once they had their editor's cut done, they called me in, I watched that, I gave them notes, um, I gave them about, Gave them about five days to, to, to implement to implement the notes that I gave them. Um, I watched that the, the cut after that, and then after that I moved in with them, and I was there all the time, um, working right there with them hand in hand, and uh, we, we were like a, we were like a happy family. <laughs> um, sometimes they would fight like a married couple, you know. Um, none of us were sleeping, <laughs> so um, it, it got intense. But um, and because because of, of the emotional heft of everything that we were working on. Oftentimes we would just pull up YouTube videos, like the funniest YouTube videos we could find. Um, we watch Gangnam Style all the time. Um, <laughs> all kinds. I, I can tell you like every funny YouTube clip in the world. I know I'm like the back of my hand now after doing this. That's good. <laughs> um, the sound design and the music. Um, can you share with us the design concept for that? Absolutely, man. Professor Bus, where are you, man? Are you in here? Uh, well, Dr. Pomo and Professor Buss are the, two, of the, two of the biggest reasons why I'm standing in front of you guys right now. Dr. Pomo, more than anything, showed me how to watch movies, and Lord knows I watch a lot of them. I spent tons of money actually here in this theater watching too many movies. <laughs> and and P Professor Buss taught me the craft of, of how to make them, and one of the things that he taught me first was how to use Pro Tools and how to use, um, how to use sound design. So I went to USC, which has a huge history of, 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 of some of the most incredible sound designers in the world. Um, you know, Ben Burke comes and teaches there. Tom, Tom Holtman, who made THX. THX. Um, George Lucas, who's incredibly passionate about sound design. They all came out of there. Um, so, so sound has been a super important thing to me. Um, our composer, I met at USC, and um, we work together constantly. Whenever I go to LA, I sleep on his couch. So we're real, real close friends. And, um, and for me, it was very important to, to capture what the Bay, what the Bay Area sound is like, and um, and it's interesting because Oscar's from the East Bay Area, and BART trains, uh, when you when you when you're in when you're in Frisco, the trains are underneath the ground, so you never hear them unless you're in a station. But once they come out of the water, out of the Trans Bay tube in the East Bay, they're in the air, and they're constantly above you. So hearing a BART train is something that you always hear in the Bay Area, almost to the point that you don't even notice it anymore. So that, so that sound was very important. Um, and, I, and I always wanted Oscar, any, any music in the film, to come out of the sound design of the area. So, so, whenever we, so whenever it comes in, it's never coming in harsh. So for instance, the score that's in the grocery store where Oscar starts to lose his temper, it, it comes out of the industrial sound of the lights. And, and Ludwig took, took, the, took the sound of those lights, that, that hum in the grocery store, and that's where the, where the, sound, where the sound came from. And we really worked hard to make sure that the quiet moments, you know, were quiet, um, and at the moments where where, where where music would come in and accentuate, you know, always felt natural, always felt normal. We didn't ever want to push or pride the audience. And um, one of the great things that Ludwig did was, 
I actually sent him the script uh, while we were shooting, before he had any footage, before he had anything, and he wrote two cues. One cue for how he felt when he read the bar station scene, and then one cue for how he felt about Oscar and Tatiana's relationship. And the cue that he wrote just off reading the script for Oscar and Tatiana was the cue that we ended up using for, 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 the, for the film. So he was you know, extremely talented composer. Mr. Kugler, we can stay here for an hour or so and continue to talk about your work, um, but it's time that we wrap it up. So uh, we would like to once again congratulate you for this wonderful piece of work, and we're looking forward to seeing more of your films in the future. Thank uh, you. Thanks so much. <laughs>